the YouTube stream right now. So that should be running. Uh, give it about a few seconds to start. All right, so um, today is the second last lecture. But in terms of class material, today is going to be the last day. Um, because next Tuesday, we're going to be talking about the practice final exam. Yeah, it's that time already. Um, OK, so we'll basically go through this program today, you know, Traverse Singly Linked List 2. Um, and I'm going to show you guys how to uh, write the code. And you, and you might be saying, you know, Patek, you probably have the solution already sitting next to you. I, I actually did. I wrote the program before I assigned it, just to make sure that it is doable. Um, but no, what I'll be doing tonight is to write the code from scratch. Okay, so I'm not going to reference my code that is already working. Um, all right. So along the way, I'm pretty sure I'll make a few bugs, um, and then we'll talk about you know how to debug a program. Um, because debugging a program, you know, believe it or not, okay, that really is the part that makes you study the most. Okay, instead of reading material and try to memorize material, uh, for for a class like this, the debugging process itself is studying. So. Um, even if your program doesn't work, you know, if you go through, if you try to go through the process to debug a program, you probably ended up you know, understanding something about the material that we are talking about now. Um, the while loop is not really the worst part to debug. I think uh, the worst part to debug is actually the recursive subroutine itself. All right, so this is what I'm going to do. Um, I am going to uh, OK, there we go. I'm going to download the uh, the zip file. So I'm going to download everything from scratch. And then I'll be working on it from scratch as well. Um, I'm looking for the right terminal. Not this one. Let me see. It's all the way down there. There we go. All right, so this is the uh, you know, it's it's in the same window that it was on Tuesday, and this is the kind of program where you really kind of need to give yourself time to do it because uh, it does take a lot of time to debug the program. Writing part is not too bad, you know. I think the code is about what 70 lines, 80 lines or so, but you don't want to write it in one single shot, okay? Because that is not gonna work. Um, and I'm just you know getting some. I'm just reading the text here. Yeah, the pointer stuff. Okay, so uh, so let 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 me just get this started, and then we'll talk about the process. Okay, so we'll. Uh, this is what Traverse SSL two SLL two, not SSL. There we go. All right. So now we have the C file and also the TTP ASM file. So we got several ways. To we got several ways to start writing this program. Okay, you know, I would recommend you know running the C code first just to find out the behavior of the program. So what you want to do is to make um, a watch point on printer. In other words, every single time printer as a global variable changes, you want to know uh, it's changing to what value. From what value is not you know as important, even though that also gets reported. But you want to see how uh, what value it is becoming, because that's kind of our pseudo input output, or actually just output of this program is through the global variable printer. Um, and that gives you an idea of you know what the structure is going to look like. The other place where you can also stop and just kind of you know. Um, be able to track down, you know, what these linked list is going to look like is to put a breakpoint right here. Okay, the first time you get to the while loop, you want to look at pref, and then you look at, you know, all the, uh, you follow the linked list at that point and see, you know, what you'll be seeing because you should see something that is similar in the assembly code. All right, so I'm just gonna take a little pause here and take a look at the text channel. There's a lot of stuff here. 
Yeah, the debugging part, you know, as uh, Nathan mentioned, uh, the debugging part is really the part where uh, you know, it really makes you understand all the concepts because you know it, it, you will have to question all of that stuff you know when you're debugging a program. All right. <clears throat> um, yeah. So Anne Marie is also making a good point. Uh, you know, I make all kinds of you know bugs too. You know, when I write code, and this is why it is important to write a program or write a subroutine in a way that um, where you can contain the bug in you know you, you're gonna write like five ten lines at a time um, and then you test it and then you write another ten you know five to ten lines of code and then you test it again so this is how you can double check and make sure that your code is uh, the new code that you're writing the next you know, the five or ten lines of code is is still working um, let's see it is backwards. You know, it's going to print those values in a backward manner. Um, in other words, it will print the value in D first, and then back to C, and then back to B, and then back to A. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, so, all right. So I, I'm not sure how. What do you guys want to start with GDB of the C code, or do you want to jump straight into uh, the assembly code? I'm just reading the text on the side. All right, so we'll do GDB first. All right, that's fine. Okay, so we'll compile the program first. So I'm doing everything through the GUI now, um, um, you know, just because you know it's one fewer interface I have to worry about. So GCC dash G dash G will include the the debug information. This is the uh, source code. And then I just have to name the output, uh, the executable. So we'll just call the executable traverse, okay, without the long SLL2 you know, suffix. There we go. And then we do a GDB traverse. There we go. Um, did I make a mistake? Nope, it's fine. Okay, it just looks different from you know how it usually start up. So I think they change uh, the copyright notice. It just not exactly the same as what it was before. Okay, so that's fine. Uh, we'll put a breakpoint in F first. Okay, so you can say break F. You can also say break and then whatever line number. But BF is going to put a breakpoint at the entry point of function F. So that's kind of a shorthand. It's kind of nice like that. Um, and then we also want to look into uh, the subroutine because you know specifically we want to stop on line 31 so we do a B31 to stop on line 31 right when the while loop is about to begin and I think that's all we're gonna do um, we'll also take a look at the main code here um, alright so the main code is uh, just calling it with M mine and M mine is um, is a struct. Okay, so the other one would be A, you know, uh, array A is static in the C code. Um, in the assembly code, I made it not static. I made it, um, uh, I made it an auto, you know, uh, initialized auto local variable. Um, it makes no difference, you know, to you, okay, because, you know, all you know, all you have is really just a pointer to the beginning of the array, so it really should not matter all that much. All right, so we're going to run the program, and this is the first time we get to F, and then you know, we can single step through the program. So can we single step. This is the second statement, and then um, PV is not pointing to node yet. So we go into the subroutine, and it is calling um, F again, and this time you know we can check prev again. So we can check. Pref, I mean, we don't have to print it because you can see it right away, right here, okay? And then we single step it, single step it, and now we want to see if uh, the PV member is null or not. So let's go ahead and check that. Now, if I want to check the entire structure, I can check the members one by one, but I can also do something like, you know, just print the entire thing. So I can print, oh, not me, mine, okay. Okay, print mine. There we go. So we can see PV is not null, 
and PN is definitely not null. So PV is pointing to the second character now. I mean, it's actually pointing to the third one because it says this is A plus 2, and A is referring to uh, local variable A of main. And because it's plus 2, that means it's pointing to the third element, which I think is the null character. Let me just double check. So we'll print um, um, my, whatever mine dot PV is pointing to. Yeah, that's no already. Um, so this is going to be the last time we do the recursion because you know it, at once it calls this, you know, it's going to stop the recursion. So we single step. Um, actually, it doesn't recursively call anymore. This is the last one. So we are now stopping at the at the while loop, and it is. This is a critical point because now we have the entire stack set up. Okay, we are not going to use up any more stack space after this. So putting uh, doing a BT right now is really kind of crucial because now I can see that F is called exactly twice. Okay, you know the second time, the second invocation of F is the end of the recursion. Um, so that gives you an idea of how much stack space it should be using. Okay, so. As we as we go through this, okay, you might want to jot down some notes and so that you can remember that F is only invoked twice, okay, you know, no more than twice, um, as the program is written at this point. And now we're at the at the while loop. So when we're at the while loop, we want to chase down the linked list to see what it looks like because this is also something that you can do, even without running a single line of code. You can actually check, you know, um, the stack in TTP to make sure that you have the same kind of items set up. So we'll go ahead and print um, prev uh, dot points to okay we'll, we'll do it this way. We'll do it this way first okay we'll be we'll dereferencing prev the entire thing so this will print an entire structure. So the first item has a value it points to the value of one okay now we dereference it. Okay, so we look at the next one. So we say P N. Okay, this is the second item, and the second item is the one that has um, the negative two. So you know that's that's okay. It, it doesn't look like a negative two, but this is a negative two. Uh, what you're seeing here, you know, three seven six is a octal number. And if you look at this as an octal number, uh, three is a one one, seven is one one one, and then six is one one zero. So if you look at this all together, you basically have one 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 one, one 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 zero, which is how we represent negative two using a signed a bit integer. Okay, so that's our negative two. Um, you can also see you know pn is a null at this point, and that is the end of it. So this is our linked list. It is entirely sitting on the stack. Okay, the entire linked list is sitting on the stack, because each invocation has its own mine uh, local variable, and I'm just basically making it link to each other as we construct the uh, the stack. Alrighty, no questions at this point. All right, so. Now we we pretty much know what it's going to print. Okay, what is uh, what printer as a global variable is going to get is you know first it's going to get the zero zero one which is just one, and then it's going to get the negative one which is this one here, and then it will stop. So it will only be updated exactly twice. Um, the first time it updates to one, the second time it updates to negative two. So. Now, you don't have to take my words for it, because what we do now is we set up a watch point uh, or watch expression, and we are just going to watch printer as a variable. So every single time variable as an expression changes, um, the program is going to uh, show me, you know, the previous value and the current value, how it is changed. So now I'm just going to do a continue, you know, which means I'm not uh, putting I'm not single stepping and I'm not going to stop at any uh, breakpoints. There are no breakpoints at this point to stop at. So you can see that the first time it changes is from a 0 to a 1. Let's continue again. And then the second time. Oh, okay, because I put a breakpoint at the beginning of the while loop, it did stop again. Okay, now we go. Now we go the second one. The second time it goes from 1 to negative 2. 
and then we go back to the beginning of the while loop and now it should stop because pref is null at this point and we should get out of the loop so we're going to do another continue this should go all the way to um, exit the program because you know there are no further breakpoints after the while loop so continue and the program terminated and everything is is basically done okay so do we have any questions about the C code, the behavior of the C code? Because your assembly code should have exactly the same behavior, even though uh, the addresses are going to be only 8-bit wide instead of 64-bit wide in uh, you know, using the AMD 64-bit architecture. So are there any questions? Because if there are any questions about the behavior of the C code, um, we should address those questions first before we try to come up with a picture of how the stack should look like and then we go back into uh, th and then we write the assembly code because that way we can track down if I make a mistake I can figure out you know where um, it is doing some update that it's not supposed to Okay, we got one question coming or one comment coming. Okay. Um well, I don't know what to say because that concept is supposed to be introduced in CISP 360 and um we also have been using it for a while also in this class. And I also mentioned you know, what it is equivalent to. So I, I'll give you, a, okay, so pref points to PV is really the same thing. Now, obviously, this is not a valid GDB command, but I'm just using the window right now. It is the same thing as the referencing pref and then access member PV of the structure that pref is pointing to. I believe I used that phrase many times already to describe, um, to describe this expression here. Yes, so printer should first get a value of 1 and then overwritten by a value of negative, one, negative 2. Jonathan is correct in the text channel. All right, so I'm going to wait a little bit because uh, Chris is typing. Uh, yes, yes, that is also a good point. Chris made a good point of um, if it is a C, C++ concept, um, then looking up, um, looking up C++.com, you know, which, which I think is the, uh, the official website for C++, uh, is also a good place to go. Um, but there are tons of, you know, places where, you know, you can find references to um, the how to understand pointers. Um, this is also, um, I know I'm nagging, okay, this is, I'm turning on that mode. Um, this is also something that you kind of need to remember in industry, um, your boss is most likely expecting you to be able to learn material by yourself. So um, that's, that's a really useful skill, okay, it is a very useful skill to be able to identify what you need to look up, look it up, and then learn it, um, you know, as on demand. Basically, this is on demand uh, learning and not prescribed learning. Oh, okay, CPP, CP preference. Okay, ISO CPP.org. Okay, well, that those are good resources. Thank you for for sharing. I learned C++ from the help uh, from the help files in Borland C++. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. That's how I learned C++. And I learned C from the help menu of, if I remember correctly, it was VMS. Um, you know, f from you know way back when Digital Equipment Corporation was still around. Yeah, that's before the internet, you know, became popular. Good old days. Yeah, C sharp is not going to help in this case because C sharp does not have pointers, if I understand it correctly. All right, so 
So what are we going to do now is we're going to look at the C code and then we're going to predict what, uh, how the stack should look like in assembly code. Okay, so this is going to be the interesting part. All right. Where did you learn assembly? Uh, is Nathan asking me or asking someone else? Oh, me? Um, I learned assembly programming from San Francisco State University. So I took the equivalence of this class um, in San Francisco State University. And it was taught by an adjunct professor who um, who also taught at Berkeley, UC Berkeley, uh, during the day. Um, and then the assembly language class was a once a week kind of class. So it was a three hour lecture. And there, the class size is about the same as this one initially. Um, there were only four terminals in the computer lab that could be used uh, to write the homework, to do the homework assignments. So you, you figure it out, right? 60 people with only four terminals. So I typically would get my homework done within the first two days, you know, when no one, absolute no, no, absolutely no one was at the lab. And then when about a day or two before the due date, oh man, you, know, you, you, you have to look at the line of people you know, who are just waiting to get a, get into the terminals. Yep, it's nasty. Nope, not punch cards. I uh, I used VT52 as a terminal. So we already had actual dumb terminals at the time. Monochrome, you know, nothing fancy like the IBM 3270, but it's still kind of cool. You know, we, we, we didn't have any, um, we didn't have VI, there's no visual editor, so we only had uh, line editors. So for those of you who are curious, you can just look up the term line editor and figure out what that is. So it, try to use that to write an assembly language program. Fun. With recursion, maze exploration, and, and you know, basically we, I, the last one of the homework assignments was a depth first search using um, assembly language. And we had to link with uh, the teacher's library so that it can display the mouse as it goes through the maze and backtrack and then you know explore another path you know using that first search. That was fun. Okay. Um, all right, so let's go back to uh, take a look at the C code and we'll try to figure out what the stack is supposed to look like. So look at the C code. And I'm going to change you know, the, um, the declaration of A so that it's consistent with the assembly code because in the assembly code, A was uh, without the static and that's why it's sitting on the stack instead of in static memory. Um, all right, so let's check out how the stack is supposed to look like in this case. I am just looking for uh, my spreadsheet. Looks like I don't have one active right now. Here we go. All right, so now we have a spreadsheet, and just like before, we're going to start with location FF, and then each one is success successively lower than the previous one. So we're going to do the same old trick of, you know, uh, deck to hex, and then hex to deck. Uh, oh, that's a T, that's just a number two. There, there, there we go. And then we reference this one, and then we minus subtract one, and there we go. Okay, so I'm just you know, setting up uh, column A to be the addresses. All right, so now we use column B to and you know the rest of the columns to figure out. Um, uh, there's no static in in assembly. There's really just there, there's there's no there's no such concept as a variable in assembly language. Uh, you can allocate, you can use byte, you know, to allocate a byte, you know, and just go like, okay, this location is, is going to have this particular value or this starting value. And that's basically all you can do. Um, for stack operation, everything has to be done by opcode because the stack is really just a chunk of memory. Whatever you want to do to the stack needs opcodes. So, so the, to answer Chris's question, there's no such thing as static versus auto versus, you know, you know, um, the other types of um, 
modifier when you define a variable because there really is no concept of a variable in assembly language. Okay, so because A is the first one, so it's going to be, let me see, um, okay, I want to take a look at the assembly code too, so let me do a V split. Actually, I want to do a split because otherwise, oh, okay, I forgot that I had the E first. So it's just a split, there we go. Okay, now, not the way I want to split it. Okay, try one more time. V split. There we go. Okay, so now we use this one to look at the TTP ASM code that is supplied to you. All right, so in main, um, if you look at you know how I um, define the labels, you can see that A is allocated first, and then mine is allocated second because A has a higher address compared to M mine. M mine you know, is basically just main mine. Um, so now we go back to the spreadsheet and um, refer to the assembly code here. Oh, I forgot about my code again. So let me d double check. Okay, mine is the lower one. A is allocated first. Okay, there we go. Go back to the spreadsheet. There we go. So A is going to take up three bytes because it is an array of three uh, signed A-bit integers. So we have negative two, we have one, and then we have zero. So the way it is supposed to look like is we have a negative two, a one, and a zero. In other words, you know, within the, the array, things are not reversed. Negative two is the value of the first element, and therefore it is at the lowest position in memory. Okay? And then we have mine. Mine is going to take up exactly two bytes. So the second byte is a pointer. It is a null pointer. And then the first byte is um, a pointer to A. Okay? So since it's a pointer to A, uh, A is at location FD, so we know that this location should have hexadecimal FD in it. So next to here, I'm going to write down, you know, uh, what these things are. So this one is, technically speaking, M mine dot uh, PV. P is pointer and then V is value, so it's a pointer to a value. And it is currently pointing to the address of A in main. Now, in as an array, you know you can just say a because you know it, it, it's automatically re, you're, re, you're automatically referring to the address when you refer to the name of an array in C and C plus plus. So there's no need to say the ampersand or the address of an array. This one is pn, so it's m mine dot pn, and it is initialized to null, okay, be, you know, because of this. And now we have the three elements of um, array A in main. So this is A bracket 0, this is A bracket 1, and this is going to be A bracket 2. Um, let me see, I can turn off... Um, nope, it's not this. I am going to turn off the options auto to, auto correct I want to oh there we go auto correct options there we go and where is that menu I cannot see it and now I'm stuck <laughs> I have no idea where that menu go oh okay there we go it just took a while to pop up oh that is strange um, let's see, okay, so we want to turn off. Hmm. Maybe not this one. All right. Auto correct options, and I want to turn them all off. Okay. Oh, there we go. Do not use replacement table. Do not capitalize. Automatic bold note. Turn those off. Okay, so let's see if this is better. 
All right, so I'm not going to fix these three, you know, because there's only one, you know, um, variable called A here. So we are not going to be too concerned about it. All right, so these five bytes is basically the frame of main. Okay, so main has these five bytes as um, its frame. So I'm going to put some more stuff over here. So I'm going to merge these five and say this is the frame of main. From main, it's going to call f just once. Okay, so we have to now figure out, okay, when we call f, what is going to happen to the stack? The first thing, the very first thing is it's going to push the argument. So the location fa is going to be used to push the, um, the argument, which is the address of m mine. And mine itself is really just a structure. It's just these two bytes here. And the first byte is FB. So FB is the address of M mine, and that is going to be pushed on the stack. So I'm going to put FB here. And this ten this is really just M mine. But it is also um, the parameter um, of the subroutine. So the to the to the subroutine, okay, uh, it is called pref as a parameter. The next thing we're going to push on the stack is the return address. So the return address we can't really tell right now because I haven't re really written the code. So we'll just kind of put a placeholder here and say this is our return address, whatever it is, back to main. Okay, so we'll make it a little bit more clear. This is the return address back to main. <clears throat> and then the next few bytes would correspond to if um, the subroutine has any local variables, these would correspond to the local variables. So um, so now we look at the C code of main, I mean uh, F, and F definitely has um, a local variable, uh, a struct X mine. So now we go to uh, go back to our stack and we say, okay, we need to reserve um, the number of bytes we the number of bytes we need to reserve would be the same as the size of a struct X, which in this case is two bytes. So we're going to reserve these two bytes. And the first one is going to be, oh, the, the second one is going to be mine dot the second member, which is PN. And the first one is going to be mine dot PV, which is the first member. So these th uh, four bytes together would be the frame of the first invocation of F. So I would combine these and put it here as F, okay? But it's only the first invocation. So you have to separate the definition of F, which is what you see in the source code, versus the frame, or versus the, um, the call frame of one invocation. This is representing one invocation of the subroutine. Okay, so one is, you can look at this as quote-unquote class, okay, and this is quote-unquote object, okay, not very exact and precise in terms of terminology, but sort of, okay, sort of. Now, these two bytes are just allocated. They are not initialized but in any way because, you know, that's how this is done. So when we get to line 23 and we actually initialize it, now we have to follow a few things, right? So on line 23, in the C code when we do it in assembly. So this is the kind of thing that you really should go through first before you write the first line of code in assembly, is to understand how it is done in C. So when we look at line 23, the first thing we need to do is to find prev. Okay, so prev is here. Okay, this is prev. We want to look at the structure that prev is pointing to. Okay, it is uh, pointing to FB, so we are looking at this structure over here. Uh, but we don't want the entire structure, we just want PV. So this would be our PV. Oops, this is, would be our PV. And we want to add one to it. So we want to add one to FD, so it becomes FE in this case. So this whole thing is just FE. And then we use FE, to, uh, we put FE, we use FE to overwrite the member PV of mine which is this location here. So now this should become FE right there. So are we still doing okay? We are on line 23 of the first invocation of F. Because if, I, if, if people are lost at this point, you know, then we might need to do something else. Fuck. <laughs> 
flashbacks. <laughs> I, I I would take it as a good thing because if you have if you're having flashbacks, that means you have gone through this process already, which is good. I see that as a very positive thing. That you have gone through this process yourself already. Okay, making sense. Alrighty, we still have two more people typing. Okay, one more. All right. Yeah. So. Um, that's something that is super important here because that's the first thing that we talked about when we talked about subroutine is you have to store the return address. That was kind of the first thing. You know, right after we talk about stack being last in first out, the first thing we did was to indicate that you have to push the the caller has to push the return address, and then the callee has to make use of it and pop it from the stack. So, yeah. All right, so getting on to line 24. Line 24 just wants to copy the value of pref to member PN of mine. So we have to locate pref first. Easy PC, that's pref, has a value of FB, FB at this point. And we want to overwrite PN of mine. This is PN of mine. So we overwrite this with just FB like so. All right, so we have a few more comments. Mm. Where I keep getting tripped up is logic involving pointers to pointers, addresses of pointers. Okay. Yeah. So you gotta code. You gotta go slow. I mean, that's kind of the the deal. Is you have to go slow. Um. Okay. Jonathan is asking a question about the last exam. You know, the the thing is, I have not written the questions for uh, the final exam of this class. Um, on Tuesday. Hopefully before that, I'll give you guys the uh, the practice exam, um, which is exactly what the, what the actual final exam was last semester. Um, typically, I would give um, the class a poorly written program with loads of bugs, and then your only job is to fix it. That'll be the C code, okay? You know, it, I'm not gonna. You know, it, it's going to be very specific. I I'll give you the C code. And I'll give you the assembly code that is not gonna that is not working. And what you guys need to do is to identify you know, all the bugs, you know, fix all the bugs and you're good to go. Sounds pretty easy. Uh-huh. Yep. And that's why, you know, even if these homework assignments are not worth a lot of points, it is very important to kind of go through the process because if you debug the program, okay, and you actually found a few bugs, even if you don't fix everything, the experience of going through this process and looking through the stack like this is going to be helpful. Okay, so so we're going to continue with this exercise for now. Okay, so the next line is line 25. Line 25 says, "Let's." Okay, so this is where you know you you have you kind of have to go step by step. So we first want to look at mine, which is a structure. Mine is not a pointer to a structure, it is a structure itself. And we want to access PV as a member of mine. So PV of mine is a pointer itself. And we want to follow that pointer and see if it is pointing to a value that is 0. So we look at FE up here, and FE is pointing to a location that has a value of 1. So this entire expression on line 25 is 1, which is not 0. So that means we're going to go for the recursion here on line 27. So on line 27, what are we going to do? We're pushing the address of mine. What is mine? This is mine. Okay. So the address of mine is F7. So we're pushing F7 on the stack. And I'm going to comment over here. This is mine. This is the address of mine, which is also going to be pref of the next of the coming, the next invocation of F. OK, so this is the part where it can get a little confusing because, you know, when I say, you know, this is um, my, uh, the address of mine is the same as pref. This is pref of the next invocation of F. OK which is not the same as pref here. Okay, this is for the next frame. And then we have the return address. So we have the return address. 
Uh, this one is coming back to uh, F. So we can say this is coming back to line 28, okay? Because it has, technically speaking, it is coming back to whatever is right after the call. So I'm just going to call it line 28, okay? Which that there's really nothing there because by the time we get to line 28, we just exit the whole thing because, um, I mean, this is the entire then branch and there's nothing after the conditional statement. So, but I'm going to write it here as, you know, return uh, address to line 28. Um, and then at that point, we are continuing execution at the beginning of, of F. Um, is it pref of frame one? It would be pref of frame zero. This is this is frame one, and this I'm setting up frame zero right now. So this pref is referring to pref of frame zero. Um, okay. All right. Okay. So now we also have to. So now, uh, now, now uh, the JMPI would have happened at this point. Um, and then we are now at the entry point of F again, which means we're going to have to allocate. We're going to do exactly the same thing as last time um, because whether you're being called recursively or whether you're being called from someone else doesn't make any difference. It is the same treatment at the beginning of the subroutine. So we have to allocate um, a struct X again. So that means these two bytes will be allocated. And of these two bytes, um, the first one is going to be mine.pv because that's the first member of struct X. And then the second one is going to be mine.pn because that is the second one of uh, a struct X. So this is where it gets a little bit interesting because now you have two frames, two um, call frames corresponding to F, which was what we saw in GDB because when I type BT and then press the enter key. That was exactly what we saw in GDB, except it's uh, reversed because you know it lists the most recent one on top. It, and, and this one is kind of reversed because we are looking at it from the memory perspective. All right, so we get in here and it's gonna have to go through line 23 and line 24 again. So line 23, so we're gonna do exactly, you know, uh, what this expression is calling for. So we have to go to pref first. So pref is right here. It is F7. We uh, we follow F7 and we end up, you know, in a structure. When we end up with a structure, you know, typically we want to find out which member we want to access. In this case, we want, we want to access PV, which is this one over here, which by itself is a pointer. Uh, it is a pointer with a value of FE. In other words, it is pointing to location FE. We want to add one to it, so it becomes FF. So the right-hand side becomes FF. And then we use FF to update PV of mine. And this time we're talking about this mine over here. So PV of mine is updated to FF in this case. Um, and then we go to line 24. We locate PREV. PREV is here. It is just F7 and we use it to update uh, member PN of mine. So this one is updated to F7, like so. Um, yep, okay, so no uh, text messages up to this point. But I'm gonna pause, okay, so that you guys can have a chance to ask questions because now I'm done with setting up um, the, the frame of the second invocation of F. Any questions? All right, so question is, I'm still a little confused about address F7, which pref is cell D10 referring to? All right, so this is D10. This is pref, this location at location F6. F6 is the location of pref of the second invocation of F. So location F6 has a 
content of F7, and that points to the mine local variable of the first invocation of F. You can you can draw some pointers if you, if you're handy. You can you know after the fact you can draw some you know, point. Actually, I think I can. I might be able to add pointers and stuff like that. Um, I'm just looking at all the tools here. I might not have turned on that toolbar because that might be helpful. I'm checking this out. Obviously, I don't use this too much, right? All right, toolbars. There we go. Um, drawing. There we go. All right. Oh, okay. I see. Okay, so I don't have to do it now. All right. So now we uh, get to line twenty-five. Line twenty-five says, "Okay, we need mine." Now we need to be very careful about which mine we're talking about because we have two mine up here, but we are always referring to the most recent frame. And this is the most recent frame. So when we talk about mine, we are talking about this mine here. So we look at mine.pv, which is this one here. And we, so we are, so mine.pv is FF, but we need to dereference it, which means we go to the location FF, which is here, and use the value of location FF, which is zero, as this expression, as the value of this expression. So if zero is the value of this expression, it is false. So that means we get to the else case over here. So when we get to the else case, pref is um, pref is non-zero at this point because you know we can look at this pref here. It is f7. Um, so we we go to here. If we're going to print out whatever um, whatever PV of pref is okay. Whatever PV of the structure the pref is pointing to is pointing to. Oof, okay, that. Okay, I'll, I'll show you exactly what this means. So we look at pref. Okay, first we look at this, and then we look at the PV that it's pointing to, which is um, this one over here. And then we uh, ask what is the value at location FE? It is one. Okay, and that is the entire right hand side. And that is um, used to overwrite printer. So whatever whatever printer is, is going to get updated. Printer is going to be down there somewhere because the printer is a statically allocated thing, you know, in as a byte. So printer is just going to be down here somewhere. I cannot tell you exactly where because it depends on you know how long the program itself is. All right, so it's going to print one first, and then we update pref with um, the member PN of the structure that pref is pointing to. So let's follow that, okay? So this is pref. It is uh, pointing to location F7. The the structure at location F7 it have these two bytes, and we want to use PV, which is this one here, which is FE, to update... Oh, PN, sorry. I, I, we are looking at PN, which is FB. So we are using FB to update pref. So FB is going to be used to update the F7. So I'm going to use this notation, you know, F7 FB. So this way, you know, we basically know how it changed. Okay, initially it is F7 set up by the caller, and then the subroutine itself changed the F7 to FB. And then we go back to the beginning, and we first ask: Is pref a zero? Pref is not a zero because it has FB in it right now. So now we have to track down, you know, uh, what is the structure that pref is pointing to. It is located at FB, so we are looking at this structure over here. Um, then we locate uh, PV as a member. This is the member PV. It has a value of FD, and then we dereference um, the location FD. FD the reference has is going to give us the negative two, so it's going to print negative two. Okay, printer is going to get a value of negative two at this point, and then we move on to um, line thirty-four again. So line thirty-four is going to look up pref, which is here. It is currently FB. It would go to the structure the pref is pointing to. Okay, so we are pointing to uh, this structure over here. We find the member PN, which is this one here, which has a value of zero, 
and then we use use that zero to update pref which is this pref here so we now update that to zero zero and then we get back to the beginning of the loop now this time when we get back to line 31 pref indeed is zero so this is where it would exit the loop and after exit the loop at the very end of the subroutine we should deallocate the local variable which is this portion here which makes the stack pointer automatically point back to the return address so the subroutine the second invocation of f is going to use use this location and then deallocate it to to get back to line 28 so we will continue execution on line 28 of the first invocation of f and then at that point uh, the stack still has this item on the stack so we have to deallocate that byte and then once it deallocate that byte we get out of the conditional statement we get to the end of the subroutine so the call the call lee the subroutine needs to deallocate these two bytes so uh, the stack pointer points back to this location and now we utilize location f9 to go back to main and then when we get back to main um, now main I have supplied already so main itself you know has an increase so okay let me back up backtrack one more step okay um, when we use this location to go back to main uh, the subroutine will also deallocate it which means the stack pointer by the time we get back to main the stack pointer will be pointing back to the argument that it pushed earlier on the stack but when you look at main it already has an increment D so that means you know by the time we are done with that portion the stack pointer will now be pointing back to location FB and then at that point we have the stack um, the allocation code to deallocate all the local variables so at that point you know, the stack point is going to be back to zero zero which means you know all of this stuff here is is now cleared the stack is once again empty before we get to the halt instruction Phew. so that is kind of the whole story yes it is indeed like that yep it is indeed like that um, of this entire class, I think there's only one person who took CISP 300 from me, and that's also what we did in CISP 300, except this picture was turned sideways. Okay, just kind of imagine this thing here uh, turned clock, no, counterclockwise, 90 degrees. Okay, so you just turn your head like this to look at it. Um, and in when I taught CISP 300, people have to trace code like this by hand using a spreadsheet so um, so I actually introduced the concept of a return address um, how parameters and local variables are quote on the stack except I did not use the term stack I did not use the term frame I did not use the term return address I call it return line number in CISP 300 but all of those mechanisms were in CISP 300 when I taught that class <laughs> I don't think Omar t uh, took 300 from me. Did you? You probably talk, took it from someone else who also used the same approach. Oh, okay. At CRC. All right. So, now this picture is very, very important, okay? Because it shows us what we can expect on the stack. So, if the program. Okay, so. This goes back to how do we debug a program. So when you debug a program, you need two pieces of information. The first one is what we are looking at here, what the program is supposed to do. And that's based on the C code, because your job is to translate the C code into assembly code. So this is the first piece. The second piece is what it is actually doing. Now, if I forget an increment D, you know, obviously the stack is going to be messed up and it's not going to look like this. So I need to compare what it is expected to do, what the stack is supposed to look like, and the flow of the logic, the expected flow of logic. And then I have to compare that, that to the actual uh, flow of logic and the actual content in on the stack that comparison okay you know will will tell you if there's a difference that is where the bug is okay and you have to locate the first point where there's a deviation and then try to explain that deviation 
that is how we debug this type of program okay I know it sounds painful because you have to use the trace analyzer or you can also use Chris uh, no I think it's Jonathan's um, you know engine uh, he, he wrote a, a better tool than my assembler and the simulator and also the trace analyzer so it's it's basically a three in one product it's like a Swiss army knife I just give you a pocket knife and then I give you a little poking tool and then I give you a sharpener okay I just give you a bunch of little tools whereas you know Jonathan put all three into one nicely packaged all right so let's take a look at the time we got we got about uh, 25 minutes so the question is can tech get this done in 25 minutes hmm well that's always a challenge that is always a challenge all right so we're gonna We'll give it a try. We'll give it a try. All right, so here's F. All right. So the first thing we need to do, the first thing I do is to visualize what the stack is going to look like. So we have pref on the stack, we have the return address on the stack, and then we have my uh, mine variable. So with the mine variable, the second member is, I would believe that's uh, Okay, it doesn't really matter. Okay, then we have mine here. Mine is going to take up two bytes. That's all we need to know. Well, let's not even say two bytes because we know that a particular symbol is supposed to tell me how many bytes it's going to take. Pref is just one byte because it's an address and every address in uh, TTP is one byte. Return address is also just an address, so that's also one byte. So this is what we should be seeing on the stack, you know, corresponding to the frame. Um, so when I define the uh, symbolic names, I'm going to say mine is going to be zero because it's the very, very last thing that we would allocate. So that means it is at a offset of zero bytes from where the stack pointer points to when the stack, when the frame is all set up. Um, the return address is going to be, okay, so the next thing is f underscore uh, local variable size. That's going to be mine, not Mina mine and then we have x underscore size uh, plus there we go so f underscore lvs is just telling us um, how many bytes should we allocate for local variables in f and then we have to look at pref okay so pref is going to be f underscore lvs one plus because we need that extra one here to account for the return address so that's um, this is not the first time I use a structure like this. Okay, you know this is something that I have used you know, consistently, you know, quite a few times already. Um, but the labels do not actually allocate anything. You know, it doesn't uh, it doesn't do anything at runtime. Okay, this is really just telling the assembler, and say every time you see M I N E as a label, it really just means zero. That's all it is telling the assembler. Okay, it's not generating any actual code to affect the stack pointer. So I need actual instructions to make use of the labels to change the stack pointer. So that would be LDI A. Let's not use A, even though we, we don't have any return value. Just as a habit, it's just safer to use B. So we use B, and that's going to be F underscore LVS. And then we subtract that much from the stack pointer to allocate and then and you guys if you have been paying attention you already know that this is my programming style is when I open something I will close it right away and we'll also write the execute of the entire subroutine right away so that would be um, LD not LDI BD increment D and then JMPB so once again, you know, you really should know what each one of these three instructions is really doing and why it is doing it. Okay, because at this point of this class, this stuff should be like, you should know this, you know, like the back of your hand. Um, so we got some text messages. I'm assuming we won't be docked points if we structured and use our labels differently. I think the assignment said, speci <laughs> said specifically that you have to use um, the one that are already supplied. In other words, you're supposed to use um, the ones that are already defined here. Oh, 
Correct. So uh, you can you can do whatever you want to allocate for the local variables, uh, but it, it has to be it has to be sensitive to the size of the struct x though. So however you want to define this label is okay. It just has to be dependent on x underscore size. All right. So next thing we go back. And now we backfill, you know, whatever is inside the subroutine. And you can see I use indentation too, you know, to help myself understand, you know, which part is which part. So it's not like the entire program is at the same indentation level. All right, first thing first, this is a conditional statement. Um, so, the, and the condition is, uh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay, we have line 23 first. So let's deal with line 23 first. Um, and from these two lines, you know, I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of optimization here because we can see pref is needed again, you know, on line 24. So I might want to just keep it around if I have enough registers to do that. And I think I do. So we'll do, go ahead and first load pref into a register first. Okay, so we do, do LDI. Um, we can use all three registers, A, B, or C at this point. So we'll use A for this. So now we have the address of pref, and then we have to do a LDAA to get to the value of pref. Okay, so now I want to be careful because I don't want to uh, overwrite register A because I want to use it again, you know, in on line 24. Um, but line 23 does not care about the value of pref. It wants to know uh, member PV of the structure that pref is pointing to. So I'm going to load the offset of PV as a member to a second register. So it's going to be X underscore PV. And now I can add those two, but I have to be careful to add A to B, not B to A, because I want to keep A around as it is. So now register B has the address of member PV of the structure that pref is pointing to. But I don't care about the address of that member. I want to know the value of that member. So I have another LDBB. So the B is now um, member PV of the structure that pref is pointing to. And I want to add one to it. So that's increment B like that. So that's the right hand side. The left hand side is PV of mine. And because mine itself is a structure already, and you know we have the offset to the beginning of the structure, and we also know the offset to member PV of a struct X. So those two constants can be added in, can be loaded in one single instruction just to save, you know, just to make it slightly optimized. Um, so we have LDI. Um, we do not want to overwrite A. We don't want to overwrite B because B is the right hand side at this point. So we still have register C. Very nice. So register C is going to be um, mine, and oops, there we go. It's mine, and then x underscore PV plus, okay? Because that would give me the offset to member PV of the local variable mine, okay? And then we still have to do the add CD because everything is still relative to where the stack pointer points to. So at this point, register C has the address of member PV of the structure known as mine, which is a local variable. And we want to store to that location. So we want to do STC. And then the right hand side is in B right now. So that would do line 23. Line 24 is not going to be nearly as hideous. Uh, hideous. So we will go ahead and just um, do the left hand side because the right hand side is already done. Okay, pref is still in register A because I kind of looked ahead a little bit and go like, yeah, I need it back. So I put it in register A already. Um, for those of you who want to be kind of a little bit fancy, at this point we have um, register B is uh, mine.pv. Okay, so if you want to keep that around, okay, you know, so that you don't, you can dereference this without having to reload everything, you can do that. Okay, there's a way to do it because now register C is free again. So I do LDI uh, register C again, um, mine, and this time it is PN plus. Okay, so this will give me the offset 
from where the stack pointer points to to member pn of uh, my local variable mine, which is a struct x. And then we add cd. This will give me the address of that member. And I need to store to that location. So we have a store stc. And register A is still having pref at this point. So that would do um, for line 24 of the C code. I'm looking at the comment here. Oh, OK, sure. Sorry about that. There we go. All right. So now we are done with line 24. So as I go through this code here, you know, you can kind of jot down some notes, you know, on the side. Um, so you can, it, it's unlikely that I would go back and insert some lines unless I forgot to do something. So you can kind of go like, okay, line 23 to line 31 is corresponding to line 23 of the C code. Line 33 to line 35 is corresponding to line 24 of the C code. So at this point, I still have register B containing the value of mine.pv because after I store that value into the actual location of PV of mine, I didn't use B over here. So I'm, I still have B, you know, having the value of mine.pv, which is very handy because I just need to dereference it. Okay, so I'm going to dereference it to see if it is null. Okay, so we'll go ahead and uh, do a dereference. Uh, with register B. Okay, so LD BB. There we go. Um, and I kind of look forward here, and there's no other place other than here that I need. Oh, no, never mind. I, I never, I don't need mine.pv again. So I, I can destroy B at this point. I can overwrite it. And then we do and BB to see if it is zero. And then do a JCI to the else case. So we have else here. Now this is also another uh, case of me, you know, kind of writing the entire structure out first and then go and then backfill the content of that structure. So I know at the end of the then case, I need to jump around the else case to the end of the conditional statement. And then at this point, I will define else, the label for the else case. And then after the else case, I define the label of and if. So I'm defining the entire structure here, where the then branch goes here, the else branch goes here for the conditional statement. So I do this because I know myself, okay? If I don't do this, I'm going to have some trouble later on to figure out, okay, where am I in the conditional statement? You know, and, you know, do I need a jump around? Do I, where do I put the label here and there? Okay, so if I do it this way, I don't have to worry about it. And then I use indentation. Okay, so the then branch is going to be here. And we just have to pass the address of mine on the stack and then call f. That's all we need to do. All right, so we need to compute the address of mine. That is easy peasy, right? Because, you know, that's one of the things that we have done many, many times over already. Okay, it's just this much because the LDAA is going to get the value, okay, of the first byte of the structure, which is not what we want. We want to use the address. So we have the address already here. So now we have a decrement D, um, STDA. Um, and also be careful, don't swap line 42 and line 42 and line 43, because, you know, if you swap it, it's not going to work, okay? So this pushes the argument on the stack. Now we have to push the return address on the stack, which is LDIA dot six plus um, decrement D S T D A. So now we have everything that I need to push as a caller. I have everything pushed on the stack already. So the only thing I, that is left to do is to continue execution at the beginning of the subroutine that I'm calling. And someone's going to say, but you're already in that subroutine. This looks like a loop. Well, technically, it is not a loop. It, this is a mechanism of calling a subroutine. Okay, If you're calling a subroutine from within itself, it doesn't change the mechanism. All right. So when f comes back, the argument of the address of mine is still on the stack. So I need to clear that, which is increment D. So now it is deallocated, and I can jump to the end if label corresponding to the conditional statement. 
All right, so I'm looking at the text comment here. Um, that's a much simpler way to check for zero than I did. I think I used this trick many, many times already. <laughs> All right. So you might want to kind of, you know, um, make your own little table of techniques and tricks that you can use in certain situations. All right, now we need to deal with the else case, which looks kind of ugly, but it's not really that ugly because this mechanism on line 34, this is what the third time, the fourth time that we are doing this, right? I mean the, I mean we have done this many, many times already, so you know hopefully it is not going to come in as a big surprise to people. All right, next thing, okay? Now if I'm not teaching this class, I'm actually you know doing this as a homework assignment and I'm a student, I would probably stop right here, okay? And I'm going to test the program right now, just to make sure that the program doesn't crash, the stack stays balanced, you know, everything looks good. Because without line 31 to line 35, the program is simply doing absolutely nothing when it reaches the end of the recursion. It's just going like, oh, I got nothing to do now. Now let's go back, okay? That's all it's gonna do, right? So I would check that, okay? You know, if I were writing this program as a student. But since we kind of push for time, I got about another 10 minutes or so. So I'm gonna keep you know, pushing it and keep writing it, okay? But remember, when you are writing code, I know this is our last homework assignment. I'm not gonna give you another homework assignment, but I will give you some activity to do, suggested activity to do, okay? Um, even though we don't have any more homework assignments to do, this is a technique um, of how you write programs, okay? You, you don't finish the entire thing. You always want to test your code uh, up to a certain point. In fact, the first point that we can check the program is to stop here, okay? Put a halt instruction here, just to make sure that, you know, we can check everything correctly and we make a decision to call the subroutine recursively at the right place, okay? And I can still do that, okay? So even though I have written that code already, I can just do this, right? Then the program is gonna stop right here. You know, if it is working correctly, it's gonna stop right here, you know, in the first invocation. And then at that point, okay, even without running this whole thing in um, command line mode, okay, to, to collect the trace as a TSB, I can run this in GUI mode and just look at the RAM, you know, using the RAM um, editor thing, you know, just look through it, make sure everything matches uh, what we have kind of predicted that should happen on the stack. And if everything looks good, um, okay, let, let, let me make a slight modification here. Okay, I'm gonna move this one all the way down here. In other words, I would have set up the second call frame or partially the second call frame including the return address and also the argument before I get to the halt instruction. Then I can look up the stack. I can I can use the, oh, okay. So then I can use um, the GUI mode of Logisim and see that the stack pointer is pointing here and I have these values, uh, everything from FF down to F9 are correct, okay? I would do that, okay, if I were, you know, actually writing this program. Okay, and, and not press for time, but I am kind of pressed for time, so I'm gonna trust myself a little bit here. <laughs> okay, so now we get to the else case. The else case has a loop in it. So whenever I see a loop, I automatically do this, okay? There's a while begin label. Now, wh however you want to, you know, name the begin label, that's up to you, okay? Whatever, how, however you want to uh, call the end label, you know, that's up to you. And we also know there's an unconditional branch at the very end of the body of the loop to go back to the beginning, okay? These three lines I can write right away. As soon as I see this is a while loop, that's what I would write down, okay? Because this way I don't forget to write these things later on. Now I go back and it checks whether pref is non-zero or not, okay? So that's not too hard, okay? LDI a pref add ad LDAA. 
Yeah, I need prep later on too, you know, but eh, why not? Put it in register B so I can keep um, the value of prep around a little bit. Actually, I want to do the other. No, 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 no. Actually, this is fine. You know, keeping it in A, that's all we need to do. Um, and then we do AND AA. And if it is 0, we go to um, F underscore while end. Now we have the loop body. Okay, this is the body of the while loop. It doesn't hurt to leave behind a little bit more comments just so that you know when you get back to the code, you can see, you know, okay, this is where within the code. All right, so now we are here. Okay, pref is already in register A. I don't need to recompute it. Um, I need to get to member PV of the structure the pref is pointing to. Pref I got already. I just need the offset in number of bytes to member PV from the beginning of the structure, and we have to put it into a different register. So now we have LDIB um, x underscore PV. So if your program is not referring to x underscore PV, x underscore PN, x underscore size, that means your program is going to be brittle. Okay, and I believe the homework instruction itself says you know your program cannot be broken just because I decide to change the ordering of the members within the structure. So yeah, I think I did that. I think I said that somewhere. Okay, so now we add this offset to... Okay, so I want to be... I want to be a little bit clever here because I don't want to have to recompute pref over and over again. So I'm going to keep A around, okay? So I'm going to add A to B instead. So B now has the address of the member PV of the structure that pref is pointing to. Um, so we can now dereference it. So LDBB. All right, so that is uh, just uh, member PV of the structure that pref is pointing to. But then we also need one more dereference because at this point, on line 40, 62, we have just completed whatever is in the parentheses here. There's one extra D reference on the outside, so we have to handle that one too. So that means another LDBB. Now we're good. Okay, now we have the value that we need to put into printer in register B. I want to keep register A and don't touch it, so we have to use register C at this point. So LDI register C with printer. Printer is a global variable, and anything that is static, you can use this approach. Um, and then we just do a STCB. So that would finish line 33. Now we get to line 34. So line 34 wants to access member PN of the structure that pref is pointing to, and then use the value of that member to overwrite pref itself. Pref is still in register A, so now we just do kind of the same trick. Register B is going to be the offset to access member PN, and then we do an add. Yeah, this time it doesn't really matter because I'm gonna have I'm gonna have to overwrite that location, so that means I need to I need to get to the address of Pref, um, which is already gone. Okay, so because I just have the value of Pref right now in register A, so in order to overwrite the pref, I need to over I need to recompute the address of pref. There's no easy way to kind of get back to that. But first thing first, okay. Right now I have the address of member PN of the structure that pref is pointing to in register B. So we need the LDBB to get to the value of member PN of the structure that P pref is pointing to. So this is our right hand side. And then the left hand side, you know, yeah, there's no easy way to get around this. We have to re we have to redo it. Like that. And now we do a SD STA because A is the address of pref. And then B is the right hand side. So we just have a STAB like that. And we're done. Okay. Uh, go back to the beginning, check again, blah, blah, blah. You know, I don't see the, the nice thing about setting up the structure like this is once I'm done with the body of the loop, 
I don't have to worry about oh did I finish the loop correctly did I remember to go back to the beginning did I write a label you know, that marks the exit point of the loop I don't have to worry anymore because all of that stuff was done ahead of time all right but that also means the entire program should be done at this point and we're gonna give it a try I know we're gonna be running a little bit over time today just a little no more than usual all right put everything into the clipboard go back to the assembler yeah exactly what is class time anyway all right so get rid of column a paste the whole thing in and having syntax highlighting helps a little bit because you know it it would catch some of the mistakes um, undefined labels it cannot catch okay because you know I did not write the script I, I suppose it's possible to use uh, vim I suppose it's possible to write the entire assembler in vim okay but I did not <laughs> um, all right so everything looks good here and we go to the RAM file go to file come on come on there we go give me the CSV all right so we save it in the temp folder as uh, we'll just call this traverse.csv all right now we switch to the command line okay and we'll go ahead and run it There we go. Traverse.csv. Oh, we in the wrong folder, by the way. Oh. There we go. I'm, I'm inside the subfolder, you know, so I just have to use dot dot slash to refer to the parent folder, which is where I saved the uh, CSV file. Um, and then we're going to redirect the TSV to also the parent folder right there all right well I forgot to put a time out here you know because you know just in case I got into an infinite loop um, that time out would be able to automatically break the program so that you know we don't end up with a huge um, log file so now we got TSV done and then we go to the trace analyzer so if you don't want to wait for me to upload the assembly file, you just go here and make a copy. Okay, that's kind of the <laughs> easiest thing to do. Okay, just make a copy of the assembler right now. So now you have a snapshot of the program. Now it's not, I'm, I don't know whether the program works or not, but you know, you, you're free to uh, make a copy at this point. So now we go to here, we um, import, there we go. Um, so there's no homework, but I think if your program is not working, you might want to use the lab time to try to get your program to work. I am sorry, there's no point to it. No point as in no point of value to it. But there is a point to it being, you know, now that you kind of understand the behavior of the program more, you know that what the stack should look like. I think it is a good idea to go back and fix your program. Find out where it has gone wrong and then fix it. I think that would be a worthwhile exercise because you know that will help you really kind of understand the whole process. And in case somebody is asking, are you gonna make me? The answer is no, I'm not gonna make you. I'm not gonna make anyone to do anything. No, that is not my job. Oh, thank you, Chris. Making everything so much easier for everything for everybody else. Okay, so we have 635 rows. We'll go there. So A365, I think. No, 635. 635. 
There we go. Uh-huh. Okay, so it looks good. Okay, it looks good because I think 6E does correspond to where the halt instruction is. And this is how you check. Okay, you go to the assembler and you go to the assemble tab and then you just go all the way to the halt instruction find out where it is located this is lo at location 6e so if the trace is ending at location 6e that is a good sign it means at least we got back to the halt instruction and the program quote unquote exited normally because if 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 the program messed up the stack pointer at some point it is kind of unlikely that it would end properly at that place um, and then the stack pointer all goes all the way all the, all the, all the, goes all the way to zero zero is also a good sign. Now we need to check printer, right? We need to check the output. Did we output one and then negative two? That is the question. So for that, we go back to the assembler, and then we look up, you know, how printer is defined. Printer is defined here. It is at location three. So we want to look at all the right operations to location three in column C and we want to find you know initially uh, overwriting it with 0 1 and then we want to see over being overwritten by FE because FE is negative 2 as a signed 8-bit uh, integer all right so let's look for that let's look for that in column C so we go to find and replace and the reason why I do you know this one is because I'm gonna specify um, using regular expression and specific range is column C so this way it is not gonna find something else that looks like it okay so escaping the asterisk um, 0 3 equals 2 um, now this should be sufficient because you know in column C it only reflects uh, memory writing so there's no memory reading which has a double equal sign but if you want to be double checking and making sure that there's no double equal sign you're not catching those specific specific cases then we can go ahead and you know add this one to say you know the first one has to be equal sign and then the next one is not a equal sign it can be anything just not a equal sign okay so this way we can we, we are double checking make sure okay so we find the first one is indeed overwriting with 0, 1, and then the second one is actually overwriting with FE. So that's also looking good. Now, there's one more thing we can check, okay? Uh, let me put the stack operation back here. The extra thing we're going to check is location F6, because F6 should start with a, with a value of F7, and then FB, and then 0, 0. That reflects that your loop to track, track down the, the linked list is working correctly. So we're going to check that too. Okay, so now we're looking for updates to location F6. So we just use the same expression and then change that to F6. It is case sensitive, so make sure everything is in uppercase. All right, let's find. So we find, okay, this is the last one. Now it has to go back to the beginning. Okay, this is the first one, you know, which is F7. That is correct. Um, the second one is FB, that is correct as well, and then we have an F0, that is correct as well. Now, if you want to, okay, you can also double check. Um, the, the first five bytes is not going to be an issue because that is what main is setting up already, okay? But if you want to check that, you go ahead and check that too. But you can also check the rest, okay? You know, because um, we also know that what the return address to main is. Let me show you how we can find that. The return address to main, you can see that in the assembler. Okay. So the, in, the, in the assembler in main, uh, where we see the dot six plus in main. Come on, scroll, scroll. There we go. Uh, so that would be location 6a. So in other words, we should see to be more complete. Okay, you know, F9 should have uh, a content of 6a. So we can check that too. And it's probably a good idea to kind of check it too, you know, uh, just in case. Because if it doesn't have it, then I have some explaining to do. Yes, I just said that. So we want to look up uh, F9, and indeed it is 6a. So it's all checking out, right? That's only one more thing. Yes, I know you guys want to, 
you really want to go at this point. But I also want to I also want to check this. The return address to line 28 in the C code. So we'll go ahead and check that one too. So that would be the dot six plus inside function f. Okay, come on, scroll. Uh, let's see. Go down. Right there. Ah, okay. I think this is it. Yes. So we have uh, two seven. Two seven is the address, the return address of f going back to itself. So that is corresponding to location f five. So location f five should have content a content of two seven. So we'll go check that too. And this time we're looking for f five. And indeed, it has a content of two seven. So that is comforting to know because you know it seems to me that the code is working correctly you know everything that i could check you know is all checking out now next question well for those of you who are still here looks like you know, we still got a the majority of the class is still here that's good so next thing is do i expect you guys to be able to come up with this picture the answer is actually yes okay because to come up with this picture requires an understanding of how what a call frame is, what it looks like, what should be on the call frame, and also the behavior of the code. The behavior of the code, I gave you the C code, right? The C code, if you run the C code using a debugger, that will tell you, okay, what the behavior of the C code is. So all of those, all, all information is already there, okay? It's scattered, okay? You know, I, I put all the pieces everywhere. Um, and you have to kind of piece everything together. Um, if, I'm not sure whether I should say this or not, but that doesn't usually stop me. Um, I think this may not work well for people who are waiting for me to give them a process of how to do something because I want to give people pieces of information and have each person individually to put those pieces together to basically thread all of those things together you know using the understanding of the concepts and then you know the, the very last step is to synthesize synthesize the program this part is important because without this part it is almost impossible to debug the program but this part can be inferred by using the C code and just the understanding of what should be on the stack that is kind of the I, I would say that's really the the most important part of this homework assignment is is really working out the picture of the stack first so there is that's that alrighty so I am done with tonight's lecture and I did say that you know okay I, I said it already so um, if you want to use this time to work on your program there won't be any points okay you know what is turning is what it what is turned in unless you're a time lawyer you can go back in time and turn it in again but if you're not then it's already done but I think it is still very helpful if you can go back and try to fix your program. Now that you know what the stack should look like, you know, give, give it a try, okay? Because I think that would still be a valuable experience. It's This is how you study for this class. There's no actual reading material. Everything is about actually working on the problem and understanding the concepts. So I'm done unless there are specific questions that people want me to answer or address. Okay, so let's see. Yes, I can post the code. I'll go ahead and zip up everything so that you guys can have everything nicely packaged. But you can also, oh, I better save the uh, spreadsheet too. So I'm gonna save this one in the temp folder. And I'll call this traverse dot, not CSV, just traverse. And it's going to be, oh, wait, 
never mind. That was the wrong place to specify the file name. Um, Traverse in temp. Save. There we go. So don't go yet. I'm not. Uh, well, I mean, you guys can go if you want to. Yeah, but I'm going to make sure that I zip up everything and upload it correctly. So I'm going to zip to Traverse sll2.zip um, then we have traverse.csv traverse.tsv traverse.ods and then everything in the subfolder traverse so I need to do a dash r to do it recursively oh I don't have that subfolder. What did I do with the subfolder? Oh, SLL2, that's right. There we go. Hulk smash. There we go. So now we got the original assignment C code, the TTP ASM code that I did today, the trace, the object the opco file and also the spreadsheet I think that should be it all right so I'm gonna post it and then pin it in the text channel so it's gonna have the same file name as the one that in the homework assignment just download again overwrite it and um, then you can unzip it obviously I'm not gonna accept any late submission at this point <laughs> Wait, I should probably let people turn it in and now and then anyone who's turning in my code back to me, I'm gonna say, Oh, but this is this is uh how do you call those things? Um Gosh, I cannot remember that term. Um Plagiarism, that's it. Plagiarism. Yep. Then I can report a few people to uh, our student discipline officer. But then people will say, but Tech, you laid a trap then. Yeah, let's not do that. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sure Nathan has a script to do it. S slash tech slash Nathan slash G. Okay, alrighty. Yeah, you can download your own submission from Canvas. So in case you uh, lose it, you can download it again. But I think it's a good idea to debug your program now that you kind of know what is supposed to be happening on the stack. Alrighty, now. The other thing that is going to be helpful is to comment my code because I did quite a bit of optimization by reusing registers quite a bit. So um, it is probably a good idea for you to kind of comment and and kind of write down which register has what value in it as the code happens, okay, as the code executes. Because I think that's going to be helpful too to gain an understanding of how the code works. Alrighty, uh, final exam is on the 18th from 5.45 to 7.45. So we are just following the uh, final exam schedule of ARC because this is a synchronous class. Uh, yes, uh, Chris is correct. There is no class next Thursday. Next Tuesday is going to be our last quote-unquote class. Um, and we're going to use that time to look at the um, a practice final exam. Um, sure, I'll fix that. I'll, I'll make, make sure you guys can see the correct answer for the first part. 5.45, Aaron. 5.45. Yep, Chris is correct. 5.45 to 7.45. It's also in the general channel, by the way. The general text channel has it too. All right, so I'm going to stop the screen share because I think I'm done. Um, and then I'll shut down all the streaming.
go away for 10 minutes and then I'll come back. Hopefully we'll see someone, you know, trying to debug the program. Alrighty. Have a nice weekend for the rest of you and I'll see you on Tuesday.